Sarangnya dia. Give it a couple minutes, guys. Try and pull up. See if anyone comes on. Let's see, let's see. We will give it a couple more minutes. It's Sunday, everyone. Well, for the next, what, 12 minutes it's Sunday. <laughs> but nevertheless, I am here. Looks like someone's joining me. One second, I got to pull it up to see who you are. Then I promise to say hi. is my computer cooperates there it is hi Tanya thanks for joining me we're gonna get started in about what in about 45 seconds we'll get started Why don't we go ahead and get started? I am Pastor White Tears, and we are going through the Old Testament in a year, and we have been diligently following, uh, as I hold this up for everyone to remember, our going through the Bible in a year plan. We are, believe it or not, guys, already in week. 10 as of tomorrow so today i'm going to finish up week nine but tomorrow is already week 10 of this year can you believe it um and we have been discovering new things in deuteronomy um we started off last week in deuteronomy we're going to finish it up um between the next two weeks and then move on to Joshua, and then we'll be moving out of the writings of Moses. So this is, as I told everyone, sort of Moses, I don't know, think of it as his last sermons, his last uh, comments, his last remarks, his uh, whatever you want to call it, his manifesto, right? Uh, whatever you want to call it. This is what Deuteronomy is. And we left off. Last time on chapter um, six, where uh, Moses was telling everyone um, the importance of exhorting and obeying God. And I talked about how a lot of what's going on in Deuteronomy has to do with obedience. And if it had a theme, obedience could definitely be one of the themes that we pulled from. Um, and it ended chapter six with admonishing the Israelites to teach their children. Um, to train their children to not let them forget what God had uh, brought them to. Chapter 7 opens up um, sort of telling us um, uh, that the Israelites were not supposed to make treaties with any of the Canaanite countries. And so um, the Canaanite countries um, was sort of like the country, right? And then there were lots of sub-cities um, and states, if you would, 
within this country. So, but the whole thing, the whole vast thing was called Canaanites uh, or Canaan. And so he was told not to make treaties. So a treaty is when they would like come together, like two kings would come together um, and make a treaty and sign off. If, if you let me do this, then I promise not to do that. And if you do this, then I promise not to do that. That's sort of what a um, uh, treaty is. And so God was making sure that Israel did not make any treaties with uh, the Canaanite countries. And he tells them why. Um, and when he said that, it, it, they would sometimes offer their daughters as wives to the kings uh, or, by, you know, um, the kings would take wives from the other uh, village in order to get the two to intermarry and intermingle. Um, and then that king could eventually become king over both nations. Um, but God warned against this. He said, look, don't let your daughters intermarry with them. Don't let your sons uh, intermarry with them. He said, listen, why? He says, um, verse 4 of chapter 7, For they will turn your children away from following me to serve other gods. And the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. This is what you are to do to them. Break down their altars, smash their sacred poles, cut down their Asherah poles, and burn their idols in the fire. And so God said, no, don't make no treaties with them. Don't make any agreements. We won't go to war if you allow me to do this. We won't go, go to war if you give me, you know, your daughters for marriage. We won't go to war if blah, blah, blah. God says, whatever it is, don't make a treaty with them because uh, I'm going to be casting them down. I'm going to be tearing them down. And what I'm expecting you to do is tear down their idols um, and tear down all of the ways that they worship God that are not me. Um, God is counting on the Israelites to do that. He said, don't be making treaties with the enemy. We, we can say that, don't make treaties with the enemy. Now, how many times have we in our own personal lives made treaties with the enemy? Think about it. God has told you he ain't no good for you. He has told you she ain't no good for you. God has told you in no uncertain terms, stay away, don't touch, see you know, hear no evil, see no evil, right? All of that. Um, but yet and still you're making treaties with the enemy, right? Well, I know that we really not supposed to be together. God hasn't really gave me the okay, but if, and then maybe, and then what if, and then trying to negotiate um, the whole process. And God has said no from the beginning. So you have to recognize a sure no from the Lord. Part of that is being in a relationship with him. Because if you're not in a relationship with the Lord, then no could sound like maybe. <laughs> That's true. If you're not in a relationship with the Lord and you don't really know his voice, then no could, 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 could in your mind sound like, well, it wouldn't be so bad. See, so it's important that you get in a relationship with God, that you know your God, that you understand your God, that you understand what he wants from you so that you can follow uh, the direct path and that you won't be making treaties with the enemy. Um... Uh, verse 9 is our memory scripture. So chapter 7, verse 9. Again, that's chapter 7 of Deuteronomy. So Deuteronomy 7, verse 9 is our memory scripture. It says, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him, and keep his commandments. I'm going to read that one more time. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. And this is God saying, look, I want you to understand and know that I am God. I am God. Listen what it says. It says, the Lord your God is God, right? 
So it's almost like Moses confirmed it. You trying to figure out, is this the God? And Moses is saying, yes, the Lord your God, the one you're serving, the one that is blessing you, that is the God, right? Doesn't matter what other people say. The Lord your God is the God, and you've got to know that. He is faithful, um, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations. In other words, God has a covenant with us where our part is obedience. Don't forget our part. Uh, but God's covenant with us can cover all of the generations ahead of us to come. If we are obedient to God, then that will pass down through generations. That is awesome to me. Absolutely awesome. You mean if I just obey God, if I pursue his will, if I stay in uh, uh, the direction that God wants me to go, if I'm obedient, if I have a heart that is set to yes, if all those things are true, I can actually bless a thousand generations to come after me just based, based, uh, based on my um, uh, obedience, just based on the fact that I say yes, I can affect a thousand generations. That's powerful right there. If you never memorized another scripture, you need to know this one, right? So what we do with our generations, with our lives, and remember, it's not what you are saying, right? A lot of people are trying to say the right thing. They're portray the right thing. They can go to church and be the most saintly, righteous person you ever want to see. But what's going to affect the thousand generations is not how many hallelujahs you say in church. What's going to affect the thousand generations is not how many times you stand up while the preacher is preaching. What's going to affect the thousand generations is not whether or not you sing with the praise team. Now, don't get me wrong. Saying those hallelujahs, standing in support of the preacher, uh, uh, singing along with the praise team, all of those things are wonderful and blessed things that you need to do, right? But that is not what's going to affect the thousand generations after you. What's going to affect the thousand generations after you is obedience. Did you do what God said do. See, after you said hallelujah, after you stood for the preacher, after you sang along with the praise team, did you go do what God said do? Or did you just sing and went and did what you wanted to do? Or did you just hallelujah, then went and did what you wanted to do? Or did you just stand with the preacher and then when did what you wanted to do? See, the true test of blessing is obedience. And we don't talk about this enough because the people of God now think that they can just get away with doing whatever they want to do. And they want to have their cake and eat it too. I can do whatever I want to do, but God's going to bless me over here still. No, the key to blessing, not just your life, but the thousand generations in front of you, the ones to come, the key to that is making sure you obey. Uh -huh. Obedience is the key. We go on in chapter 7, um, and uh, Moses repeats uh, something that he has repeated in the last few chapters, and he's going to continue to repeat in the next few chapters. It says, if you pay attention to these laws, I'm in verse 12, and are careful to follow them, then the Lord your God will keep his covenant of love with you as he swore to your ancestors. So here, um, Moses is reminding us, first of all, that there is a covenant um, and that all they have to do is keep the covenant, keep the covenant, and the Lord is going to bless them. Um, if we go on, I'm telling you, chapter 7 is just so rich with information. Um, um, again, it's admonishing the Israelites to not forget where they came from. Don't forget what God did for you. Don't forget how he brought you out. Don't forget why he brought you out, right? Remember all of these things. And he says in verse 18, but do not be afraid of them. Well, let's start at verse 17. You may say to yourself, these nations are stronger than we are. How can we drive them out? But do not be afraid of them. Remember well what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt. And so here we are, again, God telling us, 
don't forget to remember, right? Um, he said, you might be afraid looking forward at all of these nations that I'm telling you, you're about to conquer and you're about to uh, wipe them all out. But don't, don't forget what I did to Egypt. So every time that you start doubting, I don't know if this is really, you know, um, you know, really going to happen. I don't know if God is really going to do this. I don't know if I really heard from God or whatever your doubt may be. Don't forget what God did in Egypt. In other words, everybody has an Egypt experience. Everybody has one thing where they know at least one thing. I believe every saint has at least one thing where they know for sure this is God. This is God. I know God did it. You need to be thinking about your thing right now. I know God did it. Can't nobody else tell me it was. It was a miracle. I know God did it for me. And because I know God did it for me, it is my Egypt moment. See, Egypt was the time where God delivered them. And it was a time that God delivered them powerfully. What were you delivered from powerfully that you know was God? That is what God wants you to remember the next time that you need deliverance from a whole different area. God says, I brought you out of this. I will bring you out of that too. I brought you out of this. I will bring you out of that too. What is your Egypt moment? Verse 22 says, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you little by little. You will not be allowed to eliminate them all at once. Or the wild animals would multiply around you. But the Lord your God will deliver them over to you. Throwing them into great confusion until they are destroyed. So here God is telling them you're not going to be able to get uh, all of your enemies out the way all at once. It's not going to happen like that. You know, today we like all about the haters. My haters, my haters, my haters, right? Well, let me tell you something. God ain't going to get rid of all your haters. You're not just going to wake up one day and now everybody love you because you're Christian, right? Because you gave your life to the Lord doesn't mean you're going to wake up the next day and everybody that used to hate you is not going to love you. That's not how it works at all. And we've got to understand that. He says, little by little, I'm going to drive it out. Little by little, I'm going to defeat these nations. Little by little. Now, God isn't doing it little by little because God can only do a little. Get it straight now. Let that settle down. God is not doing it little by little because God can only do a little. That's not what it's saying. God says, I'm doing it little by little for you, not for me. It ain't got nothing to do with me. I'm doing it little by little because you couldn't handle it if everything got wiped away at once. Uh-oh. You can handle it if you just woke up and all things was good and everything was perfect. God said, no, you turn from me if everything just was perfect, little by little. What he says specifically, um, exegeting the text, what he says specifically is, if I were to wipe out all of your enemies, then other enemies would rise that you ain't ready to handle yet. This is what he said. If I wipe out all of your enemies, then the wild animals are going to grow even wilder and you're not ready to handle those wild animals. Right now, as long as there are people occupying every space, the wild animals are being held at bay. But the moment that I wipe out all of the people, then you're going to have to deal with the wild animals and y'all ain't ready for that. Y'all ain't ready for that yet. Um, and... Uh, uh, ways that I was thinking of it in a spiritual sense. It's as if God is saying, you trying to get me to get rid of all of the people that's hating on you in the natural. But once I pull them back and you really see, you're going to have to start dealing with the demons because they see it was never the people that in the first place. And God said, you ain't ready to deal with that yet. So why don't you instead train yourself to love like I taught you to with the haters you got. You need to train yourself to love because if I moved all of them, you're going to be dealing with the real devil real devil so you need to first learn that i'm going to deliver you little by little little by little in chapter eight um it is an admonishment to continue to remember where god has brought them from um it uh, opens up in verse one be careful to follow every command i am giving you today be careful to follow 
every command that I am giving you today. And then the whole chapter talks about um, actually uh, remembering in verse uh, three, he says, he humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And this scripture was actually directly quoted by Jesus in Matthew, the fourth chapter. Um, it is, um, I think I told you in one of our previous videos that um, um, when Jesus was being tempted that day, I was all over the place. I remember I was like, it's in Mark, it's in Matthew, it's in Luke. I don't know, it's chapter four or something. Well, now I am secure that it's Matthew chapter four. Um, but in that chapter, the enemy tests Jesus after Jesus had been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And I think I told you in that previous video that Jesus answered every test with a scripture, but the scripture that he answered, all three of the scriptures that he answered to came from Deuteronomy. And this is one of them. We've heard man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And we need to understand that we don't live by the things that we have or the things that possessions that can be given to us. We're living by the fact that Jesus Christ died for our sins and we're in the spiritual. We're living on, hanging on every word of God. That is our life. And we need to understand that. Um, again, the, uh, a greater portion of the chapter is just admonishing the Israelites to remember don't forget, observe, make sure you remember, don't forget. Um, and then um, he tells them specifically in verse 10, when you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. And so basically he's saying, look, when you get over there and you start enjoying the land of milk and honey. I don't want you to get so comfortable. Now you can't praise me no more. I don't want you to go get a raise on your job. Now you can't come to church no more. I don't want you to go uh, buy a new car. And now you can't pick up people like you used to pick them up in the old car. Right? No. I want you to not forget how you got where you are in the first place. And continue to do what got you there. I remember when I first was getting married, the advice that my mother gave me um, when I was getting married was whatever you did to get them is the same thing you're going to have to do to keep them, right? I think it's a wonderful principle um, and, and so true. It rings so true. Um, but it's the same way with God, right? Um, the same thing that we did to praise and worship God when we were going through in the wilderness is the same thing that we're going to need to do when we're in the land of milk and honey. And God wanted to let them know, listen, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget. Um, verse 18, and I'm going to start actually at 17. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember, the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. So God is like, you're going to get over there and you're going to forget that the only reason why you made it to the land of milk and honey is because I, I guided you there. He said, but don't forget, it's the Lord that gives um, the ability to produce wealth. It's the Lord that gives the ability to produce wealth. I'm going to say it again. It is the Lord that gives the ability to produce wealth. So if you've got a business out there, you've got something that you've been trying to work and you've been working it yourself, you may just need to get down on your knees and pray to God. Because remember, it is the Lord that gives you the ability to produce wealth. Finally, in chapter 9, uh, Moses is doing some more uh, reminding, he starts doing a walkthrough of every rebellion. He says, look, y'all rebelled. I mean, he, he starts with the golden calf that they made uh, when he was up on the mountain. He said, God was mad at y'all. 
He was mad at Aaron. He was about to wipe all of y'all out, and I had to pray. And so he's beginning to talk about um, um, all of the rebellion, uh, and, and he wants them to know the main point why he's bringing this up, and I'm going to go to verse 4 of chapter 9. He says, after the Lord your God has driven them out before you, talking about all of the people that's going to be driven out from the lands, he says, do not say to yourself, the Lord has brought me here to take possession of this land because of my righteousness. Mm. In other words, after you get over there and start telling people and uh, 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 doing God's word and um, driving out the people, don't start thinking that it's because you were so right. Don't, don't start thinking that it's because I'm so right that God is using me. Uh-oh. Don't start thinking I'm blessed because I'm right and you not blessed because you wrong. Uh-oh. Don't start thinking that because you're in a good position in the Lord that it means that you're more righteous than other people. Uh-oh. Let's read what it says. And... Um, it says, after the Lord, your God has driven them out before you. Do not say to yourself, the Lord has brought me out here to take possession of this land because of my righteousness. No, it is not on account of the wickedness. No, it is on account of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is going to drive them out before you. It is not because of your righteousness or your integrity that you are going in to take possession of their land. But on account of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God will drive them out before you to accomplish what he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Understand, you're just a tool that's being used. It's not that you're so right that that's why they're being driven out. It's because they're so wrong, God is willing to use anyone to judge a nation. And he's decided to use you. And so I'm going to use you to judge this nation, right? We've got to understand that we're being used as a tool of God. It is not as if we're so righteous. God didn't choose us because we were righteous. He didn't choose us because we were so good. He didn't choose us because we was up here and everybody else was down here. He chose us because we're willing to be used by God. He's willing to use us and we're willing to allow him. So Moses continues on, um, he continues to tell them about all their rebellions, and you can read about that in chapter 9. I thought verse 24 uh, was so funny to me, because I think I told you it's like uh, Moses burying his soul in Deuteronomy, and I love these little snippets of how Moses really feels, right? Tell me how you really feel about the people, Moses. In verse 24, he says, you have been rebellious against the Lord ever since I have known you, right? Moses, tell us how you really feel. Uh, but he's going through all these rebellions, and I, I guess in his mind, it's like, man, every step of the way, y'all rebelled against something. You have been rebellious since the day I met you, right? Uh, but he again begins to say, remind them of how he prayed for them, how he laid prostrate before them. God changed his mind over and over again and overlooked the stubbornness of the heart of the wickedness of the heart of the people. Um, that is just like us, right? Uh, like we've been rebelling for so long that we renamed rebellion, rebelling uh, other things, but it is rebellion. Um, and we need to understand that someone prayed for us that got us to this point. And Moses said, I prayed. That's the only right reason why you're here. I prayed. Um, and so he ends um, with talking about how um, in verse, let's see, uh, 25 through 29, he is admonishing them again and again to make sure um, that they stay with God um, because a whole generation was lost because they rebelled. Um, but they, um, verse 29 says, but they are your people, your inheritance, that you brought out by your great power and your outstretched arm. And so he's reviewing how he prayed for the people. Even though God wanted to destroy them, he had to remind God, these are your people, God. These are your people. And you promised. And so he held God to the promise. We're going to pick up from there in the next video. 
Um, he's going to talk about um, their uh, one rebellion in more detail. Um, he's going to remind us about um, uh, the difference between blessings and curses. And we're going to have some uh, talk about worship and offerings. And so join us on the next video. Until then, I do hope that you're reading on your own. I try to admonish that in every video that you read on your own. Um, God is going to bless you when you read the word yourself and he can speak to your heart about the word that you just read and how it applies to your life. So please make sure that you're reading along with us. I will um, be back on the next video. Hopefully you are blessed and know that I love you and God loves you too. In Jesus name. Amen.